Good evening. I'm Father Jeff Hahnemann, the priest in charge of St. John's Episcopal Church in Washington, Connecticut. And this is Storytime, a production of St. John's as part of our online outreach to our parishioners and friends in this time of pandemic, in this time of self-quarantine and physical spacing, made possible by the support of viewers like you. Tonight, the story of William Wilberforce. I hope that's a name that rings a bell with you for his lifetime achievement celebrated his 200th anniversary only a few years ago. So here goes. William Wilberforce was born in Yorkshire, England in 1759, the son of a wealthy merchant. His father died when he was eight years old and he was sent to live with his aunt who was a strong supporter of John Wesley's new Methodist societies that were being formed within the Church of England. William's mother, concerned that he might be influenced by such religious enthusiasm, soon removed him from his aunt's house and sent him off to private school, and then later to Cambridge University. At Cambridge, William Wilberforce became friends with William Pitt, the younger, who would later become the youngest Prime Minister of England. After graduation and encouraged by William Pitt, William Wilberforce himself ran for Parliament and was elected. Elected at the young age of 21. And he continued to serve Parliament for the next 45 years, until shortly before his death in 1833. A few years after being elected to Parliament, William Wilberforce did indeed have one of those religious experiences in the manner of the Evangelical Methodists societies of England. And as a result of this religious experience, Wilberforce himself considered becoming an Anglican priest, but was dissuaded from that path by, and encouraged to stay in Parliament by his friend John Newton, another Anglican priest who was the captain, a former captain of a slave ship and is probably best known in this country as the author of the hymn Amazing Grace, among others. So the very next year after his religious experience, William Wilberforce introduced a bill in Parliament to abolish the slave trade in the British Empire. The bill was soundly defeated, and Wilberforce was roundly criticized for his radical beliefs from several fronts. Nevertheless, Wilberforce reintroduced the bill each year for the next 16 years and became famous for his passionate orations in Parliament in support of the abolition of the slave trade, such that finally in 1807 Wilberforce's bill to abolish the slave trade in the British Empire was passed. The law, unfortunately, was mostly ignored in practice, and as slavery itself was not outlawed, only the trading or, or, or trafficking of slaves, forces soon grew to demand the abolition of slavery altogether, although that emancipation bill did not succeed for another 30 years. Finally passed on July 26, 1833, and three days later William Wilberforce died and was buried in Westminster Abbey. There were, in his day, two great oppositions, two great forces of opposition to Wilberforce's life work. First, there was the West Indian lobby in Parliament, who successfully maneuvered year after year to politically defeat these bills or delay them, because the sugarcane plantations back in the West Indies could not be profitable without slaves. But the other great opponent to the abolition of slavery was the Christian Church. For the matter of slavery, the Bible was very clear. Slavery was established by God in creation, found in the mark of Cain, Abel's brother, and in the curse of Noah's son, Ham. Slavery was endorsed by Moses, as found there even in the Ten Commandments. The Deuteronomic Law went further and provided various guidelines about the ownership of slavery, such as one in Exodus 20, where when a man strikes a slave, male or female, with a rod, 
and the slave dies under his hand, that man shall be punished. But if the slave survives a day or two, the man is not to be punished, for the slave is his property. The Levitical Code is also clear about slavery. Quote, as for your male and female slaves whom you may have, you may buy male and female slaves from among the nations that are round about you. You may also buy them from among strangers who sojourn with you, and they may be your property, and you may bequeath them to your sons after you, to inherit as a possession forever. The Christian New Testament is less explicit about slavery than the Hebrew Scriptures, but still neither Jesus nor St. Paul nor any of the other writers in the New Testament were recorded anything that was said in opposition to the institution of slavery, which was prominent and very much a part of the life of Palestine and the Roman Empire at that time. Jesus casually mentions slavery in, in the parable of the unforgiving servant. And in that parable of the watchful slaves, Luke 12, there was a marvelous opportunity for Jesus to condemn the abuses of slavery, but he said nothing. In that parable, Jesus mentions how the slave says to himself, my master is delayed in coming, and that slave begins to beat the male and female slaves, and to eat and drink and get drunk. And the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and that slave who knew his master's will but did not make ready or act according to his will, that slave shall receive a severe beating, says Jesus. St. Paul famously sent the slave Onesimus back to his owner Philemon, explicitly supporting the institution of slavery, when, for instance, in Ephesians he writes, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your earthly masters, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart. Or in 1 Timothy, let all who are under the yoke of slavery regard their masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be defamed. And if anyone teaches otherwise, and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the teaching which accords with godliness, that person is conceited and understands nothing. All this despite Paul's more laudable phrase that in Christ there is no slave or free man. And Christian tradition further supported the institution of slavery throughout its long history. The Council of Gangra, around 340, pronounced the Church's curse on those who taught the emancipation of slaves. Pope Gregory I, around 600, wrote that slaves should be told not to despise their masters and to recognize that they are only slaves. Thomas Aquinas, in the 13th century, accepted the teachings of Aristotle that slavery was natural. Pope Nicholas V in the 15th century granted to the kings of Spain and Portugal the right to reduce any Saracens, that is Muslims, and pagans and other unbelievers to perpetual slavery. Pope Paul III in 1548 confirmed that any individual may freely buy, sell, and own slaves, and runaway slaves were, be to, were, were to be returned to their masters for punishment. Late in the 17th century, in the midst of the Enlightenment, Nicholas Leander, a Roman Catholic theologian, wrote, It is certainly a matter of faith that this sort of slavery in which a man serves his master as his slave is altogether lawful. This is proved from Holy Scripture, he writes. It is also proved from reason, for it is not unreasonable that just as things which are captured in the just war pass into the power and ownership of the victors, so persons captured in war pass into the ownership of their captives. All theologians, he writes, are unanimous on this. Thus it is not at all surprising that Jefferson Davis, in his inaugural address as the president, the new first president of the American Confederate States, declared that slavery was established by the decree of Almighty God, is found in every book of the Bible, is sanctioned in Scripture in both Testaments from Genesis to Revelation. It has existed in all ages, 
has been found among the people of the highest civilization and in nations of the highest proficiency in arts. Likewise, in the 19th century, Presbyterian divine could argue that there is not one verse in the Bible inhibiting slavery, but many regulating slavery. Is it not then, we conclude, moral? Another wrote that the right of holding slaves is clearly established in Holy Scriptures, both by precept and by example. Thus you see, William Wilberforce and those abolitions of the 19th century, both in England and here, had to struggle very hard to overcome the plain reading of Scripture. And they had to overcome the long and established practice of Christian tradition. And I think that we as Christians today need to be clear and honest about the history and practice of Christianity in the past. For instance, a recent General Convention of the Episcopal Church declared, for the first time, that the institution of slavery was and is a sin. A sin that continues to plague the common life in the Church and in our culture. That convention expressed profound regret that A, the Episcopal Church lent the institution of slavery its support and justification based on Scripture, and B, after slavery was formally abolished, the Episcopal Church continued for at least a century to support de jure and de facto segregation and discrimination. That general convention apologized for the Church's complicity in and the injury done by the institution of slavery and its aftermath, declaring that we repent of this sin and ask God's grace and forgiveness. That convention also recognized that the Bible has sometimes been used to justify oppressive institutions and practices, and therefore recognized with gratitude the upcoming bicentenary of the British abolition of slavery giving thanks to God for those courageous witnesses to the liberating faith of the gospel, people like William Wilberforce. And thus we must remember and be reminded that scripture and tradition are not sufficient in theological debates, clearly. For the church here changed its position on slavery despite overwhelming justification by both scripture and tradition. And few would ever imagine going back to those earlier days and allowing the enslavement of our fellow human beings. Thus, beyond scripture and tradition, there must be some larger guiding principle in the organizing of the life and teachings of the Christian church. Perhaps it is this. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ said. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Upon these two practices hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, let your continual mercy kindle in your church the never-failing gift of love, that following the example of your servant William Wilberforce, we may have the grace to defend the poor and maintain the cause of those who have no helper, for the sake of him who gave his life for us, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I hope you enjoyed this story time. You'll find it here every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, live streamed on the St. John's Facebook page. And you'll find it also stored on the St. John's YouTube page. So if you've missed a past uh, story time or want to hear one again, you can find them there. Until then, good night and God bless.